All right, uh, welcome back to Business Law Online. Um, I trust that all of you are keeping up to date with these lectures. And uh, let me see my cat here. I'll introduce you to my cat. It's actually not my cat, it's my daughter's cat. So this is Gemini. Um, and uh, anytime I'm filming for a uh, business law, she likes to jump up on the desk and, um, and uh, just make her presence known. Uh, she likes lots of attention. She also likes to sit near the window uh, by, by the desk and watch the birds and the squirrels. But, uh, all right, enough of that. So anyway, um, I hope you're all keeping up to date with respect to uh, uh, the class uh, and the lectures and, and the assignments. Um, and the next couple of lectures, we're going to be covering real property. Now, real property is an important subject, and I want you to keep an open mind about real property. When you think about real property, what is it that you think of? You think of things like land and buildings and homes and apartments, and that's all part of it. But I want you to think about real property as a bundle of rights. And um, uh, it, it's really not an issue of ownership or renting. It's really more a bundle of rights. What rights do you have attached to that land? So, for instance, I want to compare ownership and renting. Now, with uh, ownership, uh, do you have a right to possess the property? Yes, absolutely. And what document gives you that right? Well, the deed. Um, what about uh, if you rent? Do you, when you rent, do you have a right to possess the property. Yes, you do. And what document gives you that right? The lease. Um, what about uh, the right to use the property? When you own the property, uh, can you use the property? Yes, you can. Of course, subject um, to applicable zoning laws. And there may be some actually restrictions about use in the deed. There might be. Uh, but you can basically use it. What about when you lease property, when you rent property? Can you use it? Do you have the right to use it? You do. You do have the right to use it, of course, subject to applicable local laws, uh, as well as uh, uh, the lease itself, but you have a right to use it. Uh, what about the right to improve it? What if you want to build an extension or change something inside? If you own the property, do you have that right? Absolutely. Uh, provided, of course, uh, you comply with uh, applicable local laws, and also the deed. It's possible that there could be restrictions in the deed uh, about how you can improve the property. Uh, for instance, here on Long Island, out in Suffolk County, um, there was a sense, particularly out uh, on the North Fork and the South Fork uh, of, of Suffolk County, um, uh, that, that the farms were disappearing. And that farms, farmland, is very picturesque. And in some ways, it's really good for business. It's good for the tourists who go out to the Hamptons, to out, who go out to the North Fork, uh, as you're driving out there, to see, to see all of these farms. And um, uh, they, uh, uh, the county decided, well, we'll buy the development rights from the farmers. Uh, the farmers can continue to own the land, but we'll buy their right to improve it, and then we'll put a restrictive covenant in their deed. This way, uh, the farm will always be a farm, and it can never be what? Developed or improved. Uh, what about with a lease? Do you have a right to improve it? Absolutely. You have a right to, well, you have a right to improve it, provided, of course, it's in the lease. Uh, so, so far, ownership versus leasing are pretty similar. With both, you have a right to possess it, you have a right to use it, uh, and you have a right to improve it. Uh, what about assigning the property? In other words, transferring possession. If you own the property, can you do that? Absolutely. Absolutely, provided um, uh, there, there are no restrictions in the, in the deed. Uh, but you can sign it, you can give it away, you can do whatever you want. What about with respect to the lease, lease property? Can you assign it? Can you transfer it? Absolutely. That's called subleasing. So you have a right to, uh, provided, of course, it's in the lease. So I want you to think about uh, real property more as a bundle of rights than anything else. And indeed, actually, uh, in both instances, whether you own or lease, uh, applicable zoning laws apply, uh, as well as various environmental laws. So uh, in, in a lot of ways, 
uh, it, owning and leasing are very similar. Now, I want you to think about now about what does real property physically consist of, and then we're going to talk about what it legally consists of. Physically, um, uh, real property consists of five different elements. Uh, number one, you have what's referred to as surface rights, right? As you're surveying uh, a piece of property, what's on that property? You have the land itself, and there are also buildings and improvements on that land. Those are surface rights, what you have a right to do on the surface of the property. But is that the end of it? Well, um, I, I knew of someone, um, and uh, she decided one day uh, in the 70s that she was going to buy a lot of land in Texas, a sub, in, in, in an area uh, that she was hoping would become a suburb of Houston. Why? Well, in the 70s, the price of oil skyrocketed. Texas is obviously an important oil producing state, and the center of that oil production is Houston. So she was hoping that what? Eventually all this land that she bought outside of Houston would become a suburb, and that she would get a pretty nice return on her investment. Well, um, she never, uh, developers were never really interested in the property, uh, but one day she got a knock on the door, uh, and it was an oil company. And they asked her, uh, uh, if they could drill on her property for oil. They believe that oil was in her property. So what else does real property physically consist of? Subsurface rights, what's under the ground. That's part of real property as well. Uh, that's things like minerals, oil. It could also be water. Uh, I once had a client uh, who had a, a couple hundred acres upstate uh, that he used basically as a vacation home. Uh, and uh, one of the bottled water companies came to him and said that, we were in, that they were interested in his water. They would like to mine for it or drill for it on his land. And he signed a lease permitting them to, to, to drill for water on his property. So real property physically consists of surface rights, subsurface rights. Um, what about uh, what's above? What's above? Yeah, you have air rights. You have air rights as well. Now, it used to be in the common law days, uh, that you owned the air all the way up to the heavens and stars above. That was all your property. That was all your property. Uh, what 20th century invention made that legal uh, 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 that, uh, theory uh, impossible to carry on? Obviously, the airplane. Because every time an airplane would fly over your property, it would what? It was technically trespassing. So uh, the law adapted, the law changed to new technologies, and it limited air rights. But still, uh, there, uh, you still do have air rights, uh, but it's limited uh, from one locality to another locality. Uh, it could be 100 feet, it could be 200 feet, it could be 50 feet. It depends. It depends on the locality. A great example of that is Manhattan on 55th Street. Uh, I believe 55th Street. There is St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Now, St. Peter's Lutheran Church um, um, you know, there, there was the church itself, uh, but then a developer uh, was really interested in the site. They didn't want to buy the land. They didn't want to buy the surface rights. They wanted to buy the air rights. So they purchased the air rights from St. Peter's Church and essentially built uh, actually a beautiful office building right above the church. So if you're around, uh, it's worth it to take a look. Uh, it, it is actually a beautiful building. Um, so we have... Um, uh, Surface rights, subsurface rights, air rights. Now, what else is on the surface besides buildings and man-made improvements? Well, vegetation and plant life. That's also part of what real property consists of. And those things, they can be harvested. You can, you could, you know, have someone come in and harvest those things, and and and, and they can pay you for it. Uh, what about, for instance, if you're looking around your apartment or your dorm room or or, or whatnot? What about the clock on the wall? What about the shelf on the wall? What about, say, the medicine cabinet? Now, are those part of the real property? Are they part of, of the surface rights? Or are they personal property? Certainly, for instance, if you walked into IKEA, right? You can walk into IKEA, you can buy a shelf. And you can walk out with it, right? Um, that's personal property. You can walk out with it. But what happens to personal property once you attach it to the real property? 
Does it remain personal property or does it become part of the real property? Well, it actually becomes part of the real property. And a good rule of thumb is, if you need a tool to remove that personal property from the real property, then it's part of the real property. And that's referred to as fixtures. So fixtures are uh, an important part of real property as well. Uh, so for instance, at some point in your life, you may decide to buy or sell your home. Um, and the issue always comes up with fixtures, right? So I'll have a client um, doing a closing. And I always make it a point to ask them, is there anything that in the house that you want to keep, uh, like a chandelier or a lighting fixture, sconces, something, something that you want to keep. Why? Because in New York, at least, fixtures are included as uh, in part as the sale. They're included in the sale of the real property. But you can't exempt them. You can't exempt them if you want. So you could, uh, you know, the sale of property will, will include all fixtures except for the following items. And then you can describe them, and that's fine. Uh, but fixtures, they're part of the real property as well. All right. Now, what does real property legally consist of? Now, we talked about what it physically consists of. Now, what does it legally consist of? What legal rights are attached to the property? When we talk about what real property legally consists of, what we're talking about is the estate. What kind of estate do you have? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over a couple of them uh, that are, are, are really important uh, or, or basic ones that you should know. Um, the first and most common type of estate is a freehold estate. And the key to any freehold estate is a present possessory interest. In other words, if you have a freehold estate, no matter what type it is, and we're going to go over the three types that I want you to know, you have a right to walk into that estate, onto that property at any time, any, any time, day or night. You have a right to walk into it and possess that property. Now, the most common type of freehold estate uh, is, is an estate in fee. Estate in fee, also known as a fee simple absolute. And that's what most people think of when they think of owning property. Why? Because, uh, for instance, it is infinite in duration. It lasts forever. There are no restrictions as to the time. Um, there are no qualifications to your ownership. You don't have to maintain any kind of contingencies or qualifications as part of your possession. Uh, three, there are no limits regarding inheritability. You can will it, you can, in your will, you can will it to anyone you want. Um, you can gift it to anyone you want. There are no restrictions in terms of inheritability or giftability. Uh, four, um, uh, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. It, it, it's kind of similar to the first one, infinite duration, but it doesn't end. It doesn't end. Uh, there are within local laws, there are no limits to its use. You could use it for anything you want. So that's what most people think of when they think of, 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 uh, of property. Uh, an estate and fee, fee simple absolute, that's the first type of freehold estate. Now remember, we're going to cover two more. With any freehold estate, the key is a present possessory interest. You can walk onto the property anytime, day or night, any day of the week, and you can possess it. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Um, the next type of freehold estate that I want you to know about is referred to as a contingency estate, also known as a qualified fee. What does that mean? Well, you do have a present possessory interest, but there's a hitch. There's a contingency to it uh, that must be maintained. Now, the example I'm going to use is really exaggerated, but I think it's a good tool to help you uh, understand the nature of a contingency estate. So suppose sometime after graduating college, you're doing really well, and uh, you're working your way up um, uh, uh, the corporate ladder, and you're living in Manhattan, close to where you work, and you have a beautiful apartment, uh, but you decide, you know what? You need a place to get away. You need a place to get away on the weekends just to clear your head of your job, of your career, of Manhattan, and kind of get back to nature. Uh, and you know, you know, for instance, uh, you know that I own 
uh, a 20 acre farm uh, in upstate New York. Overlooks the Hudson River. Uh, there's a little boat dock there with a, a little boat house. And it's really pretty and picturesque. And you think that that would be the perfect place for your little weekend getaways. Um, and you approach me and you want to uh, uh, buy it from me. And we, we negotiate and we, come, we agree on a price. And I also tell you, though, that there's just one hitch to the property, to possessing that property. There's an orphanage on it. And that orphanage has a right uh, uh, to possess part of that property. And that's a contingency to owning that property. Now, you figure, okay, fine, uh, I can deal with orphans, how bad can it be? Uh, but as time goes on, what? Those orphans are driving you crazy. They make so much noise. The whole point of buying this, this farm was to go up and rest and relax, but you can't because they're too noisy. So you decide to evict them, and you do. What happens to the property? Your ownership, your possession of that property was dependent upon you maintaining that qualification, was dependent upon you maintaining that contingency. Now it's gone. So is your right to possess and own that property. It reverts back to me. Possession reverts back to me. With a contingency estate or a qualified fee, the grantor, the person giving or selling the property, retains what's known as a future interest. It's not a present possessory interest. It's not, I don't have a freehold estate. I have a future interest. It's referred to as a reversion. I have a reversion interest. So if you do not maintain that contingency, the property reverts back to the grantor. And that, in our example, that's me. The grantor is the one who sells or gives the property. The grantee is the one who receives or buys the property. So the grantor, the property reverts back to me. That's a contingency estate. Now, the third type of freehold estate that I want you to know about and is becoming very common are life estates. Uh, they're becoming common. Why? Well, as Americans are living longer, uh, long-term care is becoming a bigger issue. Long-term care is expensive. It can easily run and run in the mill place $10,000 per month or more. Now, you, you can have long-term care insurance, but if you don't, and you're relying upon Medicare, which senior citizens do. Um, Medicare doesn't cover long-term care beyond, I think, 90 days. After that, you have to qualify for Medicaid. But Medicaid is not for seniors. Medicaid is for whom? Indigent people, poor people, people who cannot afford uh, health insurance. Well, to qualify for Medicaid, you have to be what? Indigent or poor. So before you can qualify for Medicaid, you have to spend down your assets. You have to shrink the size of all the assets you have, including your home. You own your home, or at least a lot of seniors do. And a lot of seniors are not comfortable with this. They would prefer what? That when they die, their home goes to whom? It goes to uh, uh, their children, their grandchildren, whatever. So life estates are becoming more popular. Why? Because with a life estate, the grantor, in, in our example, say uh, the grand, grandparent, the grantor transfers title to the grantee, transfers title to the property, legal title to the grantee, usually uh, a child or perhaps a grandchild or children or grandchildren. So the, the child, the children, the grandchild, the grandchildren, they have legal title to the property. But the grantor, the grandparent, they retain the right of possession until the day they die. Hence the name life estate. And then when they die, what happens? The right of possession vests with the grantee. The right of possession transfers to the grantee. Life estates. Uh, really popular. Now, um, so those are freehold estates. I want to talk about the different types of concurrent ownerships, where two or more parties own the property. 
Now, the first type of concurrent ownership that I want to talk about uh, are joint tenancies. Now, again, this is all under, um, if you're taking notes, which you should be, this is all under uh, estates, the type of legal estates. Uh, uh, so first we covered freehold estates, and we covered the three types I want you to know, uh, uh, which include estate and fee, uh, qualified fee, and life estates. Now the next topic under freehold is, uh, uh, is concurrent uh, ownership. Uh, and again, that's all under states. And there are three types of those that I want you to know. Again, concurrent ownership is when two or more parties own the property. The first and most common is joint tenancy. Now, I'm using the word tenant in a very broad sense, in a legal sense. A tenant is not necessarily someone who rents property. It's anyone, owner or renter, who possesses property. So joint tenants, joint tenancy. Uh, it's got to be on the deed. Uh, we're going to talk about that shortly. A deed is the document that transfers title from one party to another. And it's got to say A and B as joint tenants. Now, in New York State, it's assumed that there are, if there are two parties listed on the deed, they hold it as joint tenants. Now, what does joint tenancy mean? Well, number one, the ownership interest must be equal. So if you have A and B, they both have to have 50%. You can't do 40, 60. That's a different type of tenancy, which we'll cover in a couple of minutes. So it's got to be, the ownership has got to be equal. The right of possession is equal. There are no lines uh, uh, down the middle of the property, like uh, in the cartoons, this is your half, this is my half, you can't cross. No, possession is equal. Um, the key, uh, the, um, well, before we get to the key of, of joint tenancy, uh, the interesting thing about joint tenancy is that either tenant, in our example, A or B, can sell their interest without the consent of the other. Of course, uh, th there can be an agreement to the contrary, which I strongly recommend. Uh, but they can sell or transfer their, their share of the, of the premises without the consent of the other. Finally, with a joint tenancy, and this is really the key, there is the right of survivorship. What does that mean? You have A and B. They own property as joint tenants. A dies. Who gets A's shares? A's heirs? For instance, A's children or grandchildren or spouse, or B. B gets it. The right of survivorship means that when a joint tenant dies, the dead joint tenant shares are transferred to uh, uh, the surviving joint tenants. So in our example, A and B as joint tenants, A dies, B gets A's shares. Really important. Now, the next type of concurrent ownership that I want you to know is tenancy in common or tenants in common. Now, uh, again, there's two or more parties, and tenancy in common is different from joint tenancy in a couple of ways. Number one, ownership can be unequal. So you can have A and B 40%, 60%, not a problem. Um, like uh, joint tenancy, uh, either side uh, can sell or transfer their share without the permission of the other, unless, of course, there is a, an agreement to the contrary, which, again, I recommend. Uh, but the big, the big difference between joint tenancy and tenants in common or tenancy in common is the following. Suppose you have A and B owning property as joint tenants. When A dies, who gets A's shares? A's heirs, not B. Not B. So when A dies, a spouse or children or grandchildren get a share in the property. That's a big difference between the two. Um, so, you know, it, whether or not you're holding property as joint tenants or tenants in common depends what the clients want. I mean, if it's business partners, for instance, they may want to hold it as tenants in common uh, because, uh, you know, they would want what? Their heirs to. Um, uh, uh, you know, have the fruits of their labor, have the fruits of their business. Uh, joint tenants are more common, say, with uh, family members, you know, uh, spouses or brother, sister, that type of thing, um, or, or perhaps even uh, parent-child, you know, that, that sort of thing. So uh, 
Uh, actually, joint tenancy is actually joint tenancy. The principles of joint tenancy also apply to personal property as well, like bank accounts and such. So it's not uncommon that you have a parent and a child holding a bank account as joint tenants. Um, all right. Now, the third type of concurrent ownership I want you to know is tenancy by the entirety. Now, basically, uh, that's joint tenancy for married couples. So, for instance, uh, there is the right to survivorship. If one spouse dies, the other spouse gets that the deceased spouse's share. Uh, but um, uh, one spouse cannot sell uh, his or her share without the consent of the other. So just uh, 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 you know to keep that in, in mind. All right, I want to do a little bit of an outlier at this point and discuss briefly the differences between condos versus co-ops. Now, with condos, con you can have two buildings side by side, completely the same. Uh, same builder, built at the same time, same materials, same labor, completed at the same time. And the issue is, well, um, uh, if one is a condo and one is a co-op, legally, they are different. How? Well, with a condo, a condo is actually real property. A condo, when you own a condo, you own the individual unit itself, and you own the common area. You own it as tenants in common. So uh, you own the individual unit itself. With co-ops, you don't own the unit. You don't own the building. Who owns the building? Who owns the unit? The co-op corporation. Now, corporations, how do, they, how do they express ownership? They express it in shares. They issue shares. When you own a share of a corporation, you own that corporation. Co-op corporations sell shares. So when you buy a co-op, you're actually buying shares. You're not buying anything else. You're buying shares. And um, uh, what does that mean? Well, when you buy the shares, it gives you the right to lease a unit in the building. That's what it gives you. You don't own the individual unit. You only own those shares. Now, legally, a co-op is personal property. Shares in a corporation are personal property. Uh, what does that mean? Well, in New York, for instance, uh, if you wanted to collect on a judgment, you can only basically collect... Uh, personal property to satisfy the judgment. So suppose at the end of trial, you got a favorable verdict, the jury awarded you money, now you have to find assets to satisfy uh, that money judgment. Well, uh, you can only collect against personal property. You cannot collect against uh, real property. You can file a lien against the real property, but you can't collect it. You cannot collect it. Uh, but you can collect personal property. So you could technically seize someone's co-op shares to satisfy that judgment. Uh, so that's a big difference between the two. All right. How is real property... That's, that's, that's it for that outline. How is real property transferred? Well, there are a couple of ways. The most common way is a sale. A sale or conveyance. Now, how does that happen? How does a closing take place? Right? I'm sure all of you at some point are going to sit down at a closing uh, and, and at some point in your lives if you want to and, and buy or sell your home. Well, the first step is a contract. And as you should have remembered, uh, the statute of frauds requires what? That any contract for the sale of property has to be what? In writing. So you have to have a written contract. That's the first step of a sale or conveyance. Second, you have to order a title report. Now, what does a title report do? Basically, it does a lot of things, but basically it ensures that the property you are buying is marketable, has a marketable title. What does marketable title mean? That means the property itself is free of any liens or encumbrances. What's a lien or encumbrance? It's, it's kind of like a legal barnacle. Right? A barnacle is a shellfish. It attaches itself to the bottom of a, of a boat. It attaches itself to uh, a, a pier. Right? It's a legal barnacle. A lien or encumbrance attaches to the property. And what that is, is it's kind of like a demand for payment. Perhaps the most common type of lien is a mechanics lien. So 
suppose, for instance, you want to buy a house. You love that house. And one of the things about the house that you like is it has a new roof. Uh, there's a new roof. The owner, the person selling the house, uh, had a new roof installed five years ago. The roof is basically brand new. Problem is, the owner never paid the roofer. Well, the roofer can go down to the county clerk's office and file a lien. In New York, that's referred to as a mechanics lien. Not necessarily someone who works on cars. It's any kind of tradesperson. They file a mechanics lien for whatever the amount owed is. That mechanics lien is an encumbrance. That title is not marketable because it's not free and clear of any liens. That lien has got to be satisfied before there's marketable title. In other words, it's got to be paid off. Why? Because the lien attaches to the property. So whoever owns that property is responsible for paying that debt. So that's number two. So you have, you have a contract. You order a title report to make sure you have marketable title. Three, at the closing, the grantor has to deliver a deed. Now, the deed is a document that actually transfers possession from the grantor to the grantee. Very important. Four, four. The grantee has got to take that deed and must comply with all recording statutes. Why? Well, what that means is you have to take a copy of that deed, a certified copy of that deed, and file it with the county clerk's office for that property. Why do you have to do that? It serves two purposes. One, it establishes a chain of custody, a chain of ownership. So you could see who has owned the property when. Going back in New York, we can go back to before the Civil War. We can go to the New York County Clerk's Office and look up properties and, you know, see who owned the property way back when. But it establishes a chain of ownership. Why is that important? This is pretty common. Why? There were claim jumpers. Not so much in New York and other older areas, but for instance, out west. Suppose, for instance, you bought a couple hundred acres. I got the deed for it. This deed is evidence of my ownership of these couple hundred acres. You feel great. Someone comes down the road and says, you don't own it. Look, I have the deed to this property. This property is my property. With recording statutes, the whole point of it is to help prevent basically claim jumping. That, you know, you've taken the time to record it. Uh, you could see, you could see over time uh, uh, how, who has transferred this property to whom. Uh, so very important that you comply with recording statutes. All right. Uh, it basically puts the world on constructive notice that you own this property. All right, that's one way of selling uh, or transferring property. Um, another uh, gift, will, or inheritance. Gift it, will it uh, to anyone you want. Uh, you know, uh, that, that's another way it can be transferred. Um, it can also be transferred via a tax sale. Well, what's that about? Well, a tax sale, uh, how do most local governments raise money or most of their money? Usually through some kind of property tax. Now, sometimes owners, uh, they're delinquent on their property taxes. Uh, at some point down the road, uh, the municipality, the local government can seize your property and sell it to satisfy the delinquent taxes, the back taxes, a tax sale. So that's another way that property can be transferred. Um, another way that property can be transferred or a limited right is the creation of an easement. What is an easement? An easement gives the holder of the easement to the right to use the property in a limited way. And they're not allowed to take anything from it. Probably the most common type of easement is usually, for lack of a better word, a shortcut. So uh, a good example of this is if you've ever been to a beach community, right, for, for vacation over the summer or spring break, or whatever the case may be, uh, there may be houses uh, stretched across the beach, you know, beachfront homes. Uh, now, suppose, for instance, uh, the place that you rent is off the is off the beach. It's a couple of blocks off the beach. Uh, normally, ordinarily, what would you have to do to access the beach? You'd have to go to the end of the block and then go up up the street to the beach. Well, 
Uh, sometimes uh, easements are created in between the homes, basically shortcuts uh, that you know make it easier or quicker for you to access the beach. So that's an easement. Now you can't use that easement and have a picnic on it, play games on it, take anything from it. If you see a plant or whatever, you can't take anything from that easement. But you have the right to what? To use that easement to cross uh, uh, as a crossway, as a shortcut to the beach. That's a pretty common example of an easement. But again, they're very limited in use. Um, another interesting way that property can be transferred is what's referred to as adverse possession. Is it possible, uh, also known as squatter's rights, is it possible uh, that if a, piece, if a piece of property has been abandoned, that over time, if you possess that property, you can be vested with ownership? Well, yes, absolutely. Now, I want you to keep an open mind to this. I mean, this is basically squatter's rights. Adverse possession has been around in the common law and the English common law system for a thousand years or more. It's based on the idea that land is a valuable commodity. And if you're not going to use it, we'll give it to someone who will. So uh, there are five elements that must be satisfied if you want to become an adverse possessor. There was a recent case a couple of years ago of an adverse possessor taking adverse possession title to a, a home in a, uh, a fairly well-to-do Houston suburb. Uh, uh, there, there was an issue in New York City in the South Bronx in the early 90s. Uh, parts of the South Bronx were, were abandoned uh, and basically squatters moved in and made a case that they had taken legal title to the property through adverse possession. Now, what does it require, what does the law require for an adverse possessor to prove? Well, number one, time. Time. In New York State and other states, uh, it's got to be 10 years, 10 years for private property. If you want to claim adverse possession against private property, it's got to be 10 years. Uh, state property in New York State is 20 years. Okay, so it's, it's got to be 10 years. Uh, two, uh, it's, it, it can't be uh, three years, two years, five years, and you moving out in between. It's got to be continuous. It's got to be continuous possession and also peaceful possession. Uh, in other words, what? Uh, the title owner has not taken any steps to evict you in any kind of way. So it's got to be continuous and peaceful. So one, time against, property, against private property is uh, 10 years. Two, it's got to be peaceful and continuous. Uh, three, it's got to be um, uh, open visible and notorious. In other words, what? People know that you are in that property. You're not hiding. More importantly, the title owner knows that you are in that property and not hiding. Uh, so they must. the title owner must actually know you're there. Or perhaps it's enough that they should have known that you were there. So remember, we talked about actual versus constructive notice. It applies to real property as well. So um, it's got to be open, visible, and notorious. Uh, three, it has to be actual and exclusive. So you actually have to be on the premises, and you have to be excluding people from the premises when you, you have that right to do that. So you actually have to be on the premises, using the premises. Uh, four, it's got to, or, I'm sorry, five, it's got to be hostile and adverse. In other words, uh, the the title owner has not given you permission to be there. Why? Because if the title owner gave you permission to be there, what are they acting like? They are acting like an owner. And if they're acting like an owner, uh, that means they're exercising their ownership rights. So adverse possession, also known as squatter's rights, uh, really important. Um, all right, I'll, I'm going to briefly talk about zoning. Uh, zoning is really important. Um, zoning is basically land use issues. Now, zoning, um, uh, it restricts your right to use your property in a way that you see fit. Uh, or, or at least it requires you to get permission. So what does that mean? Well, for instance, suppose, for instance, um, um, 
you wanted to, uh, you had a piece of property, uh, it's uh, 100 by 100, uh, and you want to build a 10,000 square foot house on that property. Well, one of the things that zoning uh, laws do is they restrict the size, the height, the width of buildings. So you'd have to look at the applicable zoning laws to see how big of a building you can build on the premises. That's one thing they do. They restrict height, size uh, of the building. Two, zoning laws establish use districts. What does that mean? Well, suppose you want to open up a business, a, a commercial retail business. You have to find a commercial retail zone. Now, you may find a really great location, uh, but maybe in a residential zone. So there establishes use zones. When I first started practicing, there were three basic types of use zones. There was residential, uh, commercial, and industrial. Um, now you have residential A, B, C, D, depending upon the size of the home, what type of home. Uh, it could be you know, garden apartments, uh, sky rise, uh, uh, townhouses, whatever the case may be, different types of, of, of residential zoning. Um, industrial, there's have, now there's heavy industrial, light industrial, depending upon what you're doing. Commercial, there's professional commercial, retail commercial, and other uh, uh, categories as well. Uh, so you got to find, if you want to open up a business, you got to make sure that you're in the right zone. Uh, three, it establishes aesthetic requirements. And that could be things like the style of the home, style of signage, uh, the color of your house, uh, even a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, of municipalities, local governments, which mostly enforce zoning laws, uh, the types of plants that you can implant, so, or where you can plant them, uh, stuff like that. So aesthetic requirements, what your property looks like, is also covered by zoning laws. Now, suppose, for instance, uh, you do find a, a perfect location for your business, uh, but it's uh, in a residential area. Are you, is that the end of the story? Well, no. You can apply for a variance. You can go to your local zoning authorities, usually some kind of zoning board, and apply for a variance. A variance is when you ask the local government for an exemption to the law. I know that I can't do what I want to do with the property, but can you give me an exemption? Uh, now, the basic argument for any variance is the following. Uh, I'm interested in the property. Uh, but for the use I want to use it, it's not economically feasible unless I get uh, a variance. So economic feasibility is a big part of it. All right, uh, that's it for this lecture. Uh, the next lecture, we're going to cover um, environmental laws and then also uh, leases. All right, keep up the good work.